Someone asked in seeing the, the background screen this morning, is this a rerun? I said yes, we'll fast forward through the first part. Last Sunday morning, an event happened that would be an uncommon event in most worship services. It was a medical emergency for one of the members. Those that were here will remember it well. Please understand, it was not an interruption. It was life. And when we come together in worship, life is still happening. And life has its surprises. It was not an interruption. It was a medical emergency. And in looking back over the events that unfolded, it's just another reason that this preacher is so thankful to be a part of this congregation because of the way everyone handled themselves. Much has been said about the way the, the medical personnel, and the, those who have medical training, responded immediately to be over and help uh, the, the member that needed attention. But those that did not have medical training and those that felt that they would not be able to benefit directly by being immediately present maintained their seats. They, they stayed out of the way. There was a calmness that was evident among the entirety of the congregation. No one pulled hair, or eyebrows that doesn't have hair. Uh, th there was not an overabundance of sweating and fretting. It was handled in a very proper way. The elders, the, uh, within about 25 seconds of a statement being made that a brother needed help, one of the elders was up here to be in a position to help direct things, and the rest were in the back overviewing the situation and were able to make the uh, announcement that we needed to move to the fellowship hall when the proper time came. All of that being said, sure, the, 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 there's room to, to learn and grow from events such as that, but thank you to the elders, to the medical personnel that, uh, that, that so quickly responded to every member of the congregation that, that was aware of the importance of the situation and either reached for a phone to call an ambulance or reached for the pew and kept yourself right there instead of getting up and, and, and rubbernecking as so often happens when you're on the highway. Thank you for the way that life played out in the middle of the worship service last Sunday. Again, it wasn't an interruption. It's life. I believe it was handled that way for a reason. It's because of who we are. It's because this congregation truly sets out to be who the Lord calls us to be. And indeed, that truly is the children of God. Now, as noted, as we were involved in a study of 1 John chapter 3 last week, John begins the chapter, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, a magnificent, marvelous, motivating text that begins with a call to remember who we are, what we have before us. Now in putting things into context, 1 John was written to, to assure Christians regarding their salvation. He's dealing with the false doctrine of Gnosticism and the emphasis throughout the epistle as we can know. Chapter 1, we can know the Son of God and there's much said about the coming of Christ, the one that was from the beginning whom they saw as evidence, their hands had handled, and what Christ came to do. Chapter 2, we can know the Word of God. There's the standard that God has given. We can know how to live and how not to live. Chapter 3, we can know the children of God. Chapter 4, we can know the love of God. And chapter 5, we can know that we are of God. And honing our attention to chapter 3, where our focus will be, the text that focuses on how we can know the children of God looks at the fact that you can know the children of God by how they live, verses 1 through 10, by how they love, verses 10 through 17, and by how they are led, what motivates them, what moves them and guides them. Our focus is on the first 10 verses. And in looking at how you can know the children of God by how they live, we noted four major ideas that we wanted to draw. There's a focus on relationship with the children of God. There's a focus on a reward. We'll be like Him. There's a focus on a reaction. We'll get to that. And there's a focus on recognition. God's children have a relationship. That relationship is indeed with 
him. And in investigating that relationship, we drew out five words. First is behold, because John draws his audience to take a close look, to edo, to, to view, to peer, to, to understand. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed. There's been something that's been bestowed, and it's love. Not earned, merited, bestowed, given. This, this is a declaration of grace without using the word grace. God has given his love to us to allow us to be called. We're going to use the word beckoned. The word translated be called as kaleo, and it can carry the idea of to call or to summon. And indeed, we are called to be called as children. That comes with the privilege of a new identity, a changed life. Behold, what's been bestowed so that we're beckoned to become something else. We're begotten. We should be called the sons of God. We get to be His children. We get to follow after Him, be identified with Him, belong to Him. Now that being begotten involves really four different ideas. We're begotten by adoption. Romans 8, 14, as many are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. We receive the adoption of sons. We cry, Abba, Father. There's the idea of redemption. When the fullness of time was come, Galatians 4, God sent His Son, made of a woman, under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. This adoption involves a redemption. So we're begotten by adoption. We're begotten by redemption. And it's a regeneration. Because Jesus would say, except ye be born again, ye shall not enter the kingdom of God. John 3, 3 through 5. And this adoption that involves redemption and regeneration requires submission. We look at Romans 6, 3 and 4. Buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also walk in newness of life. The relevance simply being this. We cannot claim to have the adoption. We cannot expect the redemption. We cannot claim regeneration unless we are able to render submission. Unless we are willing to hear that gospel message that declares the identity of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the victory of Jesus in rising from the dead and leaving proof. Unless we are willing to declare, I believe He's the Son of God. Make that confession that announces our conviction, our declaration of faith. And as a result, there's a change. We've repented of sins and we want to be washed, baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. John does not discuss those ideas specifically in 1 John 3. The reason being, John did not write this epistle to convince people to become Christians. John wrote this epistle to help Christians be faithful Christians. And there's a big difference there. So often many of our friends in the denominational world will take epistles like 1 John and other writings of the New Testament and defining characteristics of what helps uh, recognize Christians and they will take those passages as defining characteristics of how to become a Christian instead of how to identify. John is describing how God's people act when he says what he has to say about being begotten. We'll touch more on that momentarily. Behold, what's been bestowed, we've been beckoned to be begotten. We can be His. Have we become His? That question will be posed again later. And then because. Because of this, the world knows us not. It knew Him not. The world does not acknowledge us. The, the world does not recognize as God's people, God's people, because the world does not want to admit that it's wrong. Just like the world would not know, recognize Christ, refuse to do so, it treats His people the same way. Relationship. Our relationship with Him, by necessity, results in a more difficult relationship with the world around us. Now, Paul would write, if it be possible, as much as life, then you live peaceably with all men, Romans chapter 12. 
He would tell Timothy that we are to pray that we might live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, 1 Timothy chapter 2. We can indeed live in a peaceful state to the best of our ability. But that does not mean that everything is going to be hunky-dory with all of the world and worldly around us. There will be challenges. The world doesn't recognize us. Whether we're talking about our Catholic friends, our denominational friends, our agnostic or atheistic friends, or even those who are once members of the church who think they found something better. They will refuse to recognize the simplicity, the authenticity, and the exclusivity of simple New Testament Christianity. The church Jesus died to wash, the souls Jesus died to save, and the way Jesus died to pave. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. We have a relationship with God. As God's children, we have a reward. 1 John 3, 2, John would tell his audience, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We're the sons of God. We know not what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The great unknown is that we know not all that will take place, all that the change will involve, what lies on the other side. Yet we have all the motivation in the world and the great known. We know that we get to be with Him. We know that we get to be like Him. And whatever that entails, whatever question marks remain, whatever exclamation marks abide, <laughs> I want to be there. I don't want to be anywhere else. I want to be there. We have a relationship. We have a reward. And because we get to wear the mantle of children of God, and we get to expect and anticipate the hope of eternity with God, we have a reaction. There's a way we're going to live. 1 John 3, 3. He that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We, we choose to be pure because of the hope that we have. Imagine you've been invited to a formal wedding event. And, and as you're getting ready for this wedding, and you know that there's, a, there's an expectation of proper attire, you decide that you're going to go out and play in the mud with the pigs. You put on your best clothes. You put on a, a, a new suit or a, a, the, the best dress that you have. Gentlemen, hopefully you're in the suit and she's in the dress. We're not going to get into the logistics of that. But you put on your best garment. And then you go out and you play in the mud. And you arrive to the event with the best clothes that you have sullied in filth. Now, does that make a lick of sense? How many folks are going to do that? We've been invited to a wedding feast. And we're the bride. How many brides would show up to their own wedding sullied in filth? He that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. We know where we're going and we want to be ready. We're not washed in the blood of Jesus so as to remove sins just, to, just so that we can pick them back up. No. We opt to live pure lives because of the hope that we have. We opt to live pure because of the load that He lifts. There's a contrast that comes in 1 John 3, 4. Whoso sinneth transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Whereas the one that has this hope in him purifies himself. The one that keeps on sinning, he's just breaking law. There were a group of the Gnostics, the, 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 this philosophy of false doctrine of the day. Uh, the, there were a group of Gnostics that held to the doctrine of antinomianism. Anti against namas, law. The, the, they were the anti-law ones. They were against restrictions and standards and guidelines. They were the, uh, 
the chaos embracers. They were the, those that were looking for less structure and a liberty that allowed them to do whatever in the world they wanted to do. They were anarchists in a spiritual sense. John says sin is lawlessness. Those that were against law, that were without law, that were the transgressors of the law, John identified that mindset, that rejection of a standard, that embrace of chaos as lawlessness. And that is not the, the hope. Uh, what the hope motivates. That's not the purity that ought to define God's people. He that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. He that sinneth transgresseth also the law. Sin, transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sins. In 1 John 3, 5, the word translated take away carries the idea of to live. He was manifested to pick up the burden of our sins and take them off of our shoulders. The one that said, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. I'm meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He lifts the burdenous weight of sins and, and he puts upon us the simple yoke of learning his way. He was manifested to take away, to lift our sins, and in Him is no sin. Not only did He come into this world, was manifested, suffered in order to remove, remove our sins, but we can't claim to be in Him and walk in the sullied filth. We cannot claim to be in Him and continue rolling in the dark mud instead of walking in the bright light. We cannot claim to be in Him and continue in sin. Is it possible that a Christian might stumble? Yes. John dealt with that in simple terms back in chapter 1. When he said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. He was describing the fact that Christians might indeed sin and they can count on forgiveness when he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, as we walk in the light, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's possible that the child of God might sin while walking in the light without leaving the light. That's how good He is to us. But there's a big difference between the Christian that stumbles and the Christian that just goes off the high dive into the pigsty. There is a big difference between the, the lapse into sin and the lifestyle of sin. There's a difference between committing A and constantly committing A. And that is what John is discussing in chapter 3. Notice the number of times, if you use the King James Version, that you see E-T-H, not T-H-E, that's just the article, the E-T-H at the end of the verbs. Committeth, sinneth. Whosoever sinneth transgresseth also the law. He that keeps on sinning, E-T-H, indicates a constant, continuous action. He that keeps on sinning, keeps on transgressing the law. Sin is transgression of the law. He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. We can't claim to be in Him and live like that. So we ought to be pure because of the hope that we have, because of the load that He lifts, and we ought to be pure because of the bow that He allows. Verse 6, He that abideth keeps on abiding. He that abideth in Him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth keeps on sinning. The one that abides in him keeps abiding in him doesn't keep on sinning, but he that keeps on sinning hasn't seen him, neither known him. In John's day and in ours, there are those that would claim to have a closer relationship with God, claim to have a knowledge of God and an understanding of God, and they would, uh, their claim to knowledge is their justification for their iniquitous living. Paul would put it this way, they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, 
disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate, Titus 1, 15 and 16. When John wrote, He that committeth sin hath not seen him, neither known him. The one that keeps on sinning doesn't abide in God. He doesn't know God. He's lost sight of both God and his relationship with God. Christians, it will always be the case that those souls who have stirred the waters of the baptistry, that have warmed the, the, the seats in the pews, that have darkened the doors of church buildings, that have been counted on the roll in the roster, that are no longer darkening the doors, warming the seats, opening the book, or living the life, it will always be the case that those souls have lost sight of God and their relationship with Him. Different reasons and motivations? Yes. But the simple description is they don't know Him. Even though perhaps they once did, they don't know Him. There's a reaction necessitated by the hope that we have, the load that He lifts, and by the abode that He allows. He allows us to live in Him. Now, we have three sons, my wife and I. We allow them to live in our house, despite some deficiencies on their part. It's, it's amazing the odors that can be produced by teenage boys. Did you know that? There's, now we know why they made soap. I never stunk a day in my life, but now that hopefully you're picking up on a bit of sarcasm. We love our sons, and we're happy to call them ours. But you know, there's some things that we'd never allow in the house. There's some things that they're not going to be able to bring into the abode. Now, they might be able to keep... Uh, we've got one that loves a snake. He might have that in his room. It's not coming into mine. There are certain things that the Father will allow. There are those things that He won't. If we abide in Him, there are things we can't take into His house. We like animals, but you're not going to convince me to have a pet pig. God loves his children, but you're not going to convince him to let us have our pet sins, no matter what they are. No matter how mild they may seem in our sight, because we can convince ourselves that anything is mild once we decide we want to do it. He that abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever keeps on sinning has not seen him, neither known him. So, there's a reaction because of the hope we have, because of the load He lifts, and because of the abode that He allows, we do not perpetuate the lifestyle that would identify us as the world instead of God's people. Which brings us to the final concept we'll investigate this morning, recognition. Or you might say identification. Because 1 John 3, 7, John lays down simple descriptive terms so that we can know who is who. 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Don't let anyone lie to you, fool you, dupe you, beguile you, or in any other way deceive you. He that does righteousness, doeth, continues to do righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. It's not just he that does righteousness one time is righteous. I've got my righteous feather in my hat, I'm good to go. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous. That last part. Did you catch it? John did not simply say, He that doeth righteousness is righteous and move forward. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is 
righteous, when we live according to His standard of righteousness and justification, when we surrender ourselves to His way, His path, His gospel message, He sees us as just as righteous as He. May God be thanked that He's willing to view us that way despite who we were, despite what we've done. We should be called the sons of God. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. There's a recognition here. God's children keep doing righteousness. There's an old phrase that we have in our English vernacular, keep on keeping on. Those preposition sticklers like me just struggle even to say that. Keep on word, keep on, uh, keep keeping, let's do Keep on doing righteousness. Continue pressing forward. Continue in this manner of living because righteousness not only involves the justification but a lifestyle that holds to what's right in God's sight. There's a moral aspect to righteousness and that's where John's focus is. He that does what is morally right is righteous even as God is righteous. John's not talking about how to become a Christian, earning salvation just by doing what's righteous. John is talking about the lifestyle definitive of those who are faithful Christians. God's child keeps on doing righteousness. He doesn't retire from it. He doesn't get to the point where he says, I've done enough righteousness, I'm just going to kick back, relax, and put it on cruise control. Satan's child keeps on doing sin. Verse 8, He that sinneth is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this cause was the Son of God manifest that He might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy that sort of behavior. Jesus came to do away with that kind of conduct. Jesus came to overcome and to wash souls from those sorts of sins. Why would anyone that claims to belong to Him want to perpetuate the very conduct that He came to annihilate? Why would we want to embrace the kind of behavior that He came to eliminate? Too often, too many in the Lord's church look for scriptural loopholes. They look for ways to convince themselves that they can get away with this or they can do a little bit of that. Sometimes they'll take not what God has said, but what man has said, because we tend to take what God says and summarize it instead of memorize it. We like our Cliff's Notes versions of Scripture, and as a result of what we tend to do to God's statements, others will take the simplified version and find a loophole in that. Example, when it comes to the teaching of the kind of worship God wants, what do we typically hear from pulpits where God, the Lord's church meets? We're not to use... What was that word? Ah, it's not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is sing. Now the fact that the Bible says singing to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. The fact that the Bible exhorts us to sing and simply to sing eliminates any other means. But we've only focused on one of the other means eliminated. And as a result, we've got brethren that are trying to add all sorts of other palms and hums in the places of psalms and hymns. Why? Because people that want to find loopholes will find any reason they can to claim something is a loophole. He that sinneth is of the devil. The devil sinneth from the beginning. For this cause the Son of God manifests that he might destroy the works of the devil. Let's not try to find loopholes to embrace the immoral. Let's not try to find loopholes to, to reach out to the unauthorized. 
Why not simply hold to the standard, follow after the path, and surrender to God exactly what He has said He wanted, whether we're talking about moral living, whether we're talking about our worship, whether we're talking about what it means to become a Christian, or identifying the very church that He established based on the New Testament pattern of how the church is organized and behaved, behaves. No matter what we're discussing, why not simply use His standard? Because that's what His children do. Recognition. You can identify them by the way they live. They keep doing righteousness, God's children. Whereas the devil's, Satan's children, they keep doing sin. Verse 9. He that is begotten of God doth not sin, for his seed abideth in him. And he cannot sin because he's begotten of God. Our Calvinist friends will take this to mean that God prevents a person from sin, will not, literally will not allow him to sin. That's not the idea. Parents, you remember that, that first moment holding a, your newborn child? Go back to it. Think about it. That first moment, holding that, that first child. Now, just imagine holding that child over a concrete floor and going, whoop! Can you even imagine doing that? Could you literally do it? I mean, literally, you have control of your muscles. You could literally hold this precious relationship in your hand and just drop it. But can you let yourself do it? Maybe it's not a child. Maybe it's a beloved parent. Maybe a father that's always done everything perfectly for you. Could you drop that relationship? Because that's exactly what John's describing here. We're begotten of God. He's our father. We can't allow ourselves to take that, to take that relationship and just drop it. And therefore sin. He... He that is of God doth not commit sin. It's not that it's impossible for the Christian to sin. It's that we don't want to behave that way. We can't allow ourselves to behave that way. It's a prohibitive statement. We don't do this. Much like you might tell someone else, you can't turn right on red. Well, the person might do it anyway, but he'll pay the consequences. 1 John 3, 9. Is not describing an impossibility. 1 John 3 9 describes an unacceptable situation. Amen. We just can't let ourselves do it. Which brings us to verse 10. Satan's children can't keep on in righteousness. And this the children of God are manifested in the children of the devil. He that doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Closing statement for this line of thinking. Just like God's children can't let themselves depart from righteousness and pursue off after iniquity, Satan's children can't do the opposite. They just can't give up the sin. Which brings us to this question, which are you? Are you the one that keeps on doing what's right? Are you the one that wants to keep on doing what's right, but you've really not started yet? Are you the child of God? Or does your life identify you as living the heritage of someone else? We've already discussed what it means to become a child of God, ultimately being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. There's a relationship and a reward. There's a reaction. When you look in the mirror, do you recognize yourself? Are you His or do you belong to someone else? If you're ready to be His... If you're ready to take advantage of that summons that John declared, we have a name, we have love given to us, we have a hope set before us, what will you do with it? Will you take advantage of this very moment while we stand together and while we sing?